You can't be authentic until you accept your own uniqueness. God knows exactly what he's doing and he does things on purpose, but we can't make use of the uniqueness that God has given us if we keep trying to be like somebody else. You're never truly free until you no longer have a need to impress anyone. I'm tired of the phoniness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just think that especially Christians get this idea that people are not going to think well of them unless they're always okay and mm -hmm. everything's always wonderful. And if you, if you really start thinking about it, almost every person you ask them how they are, oh, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord, I'm fine or I'm good. And you know, I'd say better than 50% of the time, that's just not true. They're going through something, they're hurting, they've got a headache or whatever. And I understand we don't want to spill our guts to everybody, you know, that comes along. And in a way we are fine if we're fine spiritually. But I just think that there's not a lot of real, close, honest relationships anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think if we want to have better relationships, Laurie says to me, how are you, Joyce? I mean, I should be able to say to her, you know, I went through a real rough time last week, blah, 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 with this and that, and, but I know that God's gonna take care of it. I've been doing a, working on a devotional on Psalms, and it's really came clear to me in reading the Psalms. David was so brutally honest with God about how he felt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did not hold back how he felt, but he always ended. The Psalm always ends with, but I know you'll take care of me. I, I know you love me, but I think we need, I just think we need to be more honest with one another. I mean, do we really think that Jonah was fine when he was in the whale's belly <laughs> or that Job was fine when he had all those boils? And so I just think, I think we need to start being more honest. Okay, um, authentic and uniquely you, authentically uniquely you is the name of the book, but talking about the subject of authenticity, before we started talking, my angle on this was when are you too authentic? Because you even alluded to just now, you said, you know, you don't wanna just spill your guts to everyone every time, but there should be a new awareness of authenticity. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's sweeping through, it's, feels like a very timely, fresh subject mm -hmm. and fresh book. So 100% we need to break this down. Mm -hmm. But you can go too far where you just dread to even ask a person, how are you doing? Because you know you're going to get yeah. a, a, a big <laughs> uh, regurgitation of bad. Well, there so, is the other side of that where people just do nothing but complain and murmur about everything. And that's another that's a whole different set of problems than what we're talking about here. And the other reason why people are not honest with each other and authentic is because, and I hate to say it this way, but there's just not a lot of people that you can trust anymore right. with your secrets. And so if I say to you, you know, one of my kids is going through something right now and it's really been hard for me, you know, I don't want to say that to you unless I'm pretty sure that you're not going to get on but Facebook or Twitter media. or on mm -hmm. the phone and, oh, man, you should hear what, what Joyce is going through. So I think we have a double problem. If we're going to be more authentic with each other, obviously you have to pick who you feel like you can trust to do that with. Mm -hmm. Feels like what you're doing is you're wanting to, if we use the old analogy of a road, one ditch... Right. is basically being a gossip. Right. And the other ditch is being so scared to tell anybody anything that you're going through right. that you're cloistered in the ivory tower right. and you never get any help or anything going on. So you've got this, you know, the two ditches. We need to stay on the road yeah. of authenticity. So what is authenticity? You've just written a book about it. What Kind of well, give us the the truth about what, the, what, what we're really if wanting. If I'm an authentic person, okay. I'm gonna be the same in the grocery store, right. in the bank, 
in the supermarket as I am sitting right here on this platform. Okay. I'm not, I'm not going to say one thing when people are watching and then do another when I think nobody's watching because Amen. God is always watching. Mm -hmm. And Jesus had a lot of scathing words for the phonies. Mm. He did not like phoniness, and that was what he told the real religious scribes and Pharisees. You tell everybody else what to do, but you don't do it yourself. And I think we have, I, you know, I'm a pretty real person anyway, so this is kind of not real hard for me if I could be accused of being, you know, too real sometimes. <laughs> but um, I have a real hard time with people that are always fine and always okay and they never have a problem. And I think those are the kind of people that can really make other people think, I must really be messed up. Mm -hmm. You know, because I've got, I've got some problems, but everybody I talk to is always perfectly fine. And I don't think, the reason why I put those two subjects together is you can't be authentic until you accept your own uniqueness. Okay. See, they go together. It's like, I have to accept myself and be okay with it. I'm not like, I'm not like Lori. I'm not like you and you're not, not this or that. And if you don't accept that, then you become not authentic in that you're always pretending to be something that you're not. And boy, how much of that do we have? Mm. You know, it's like. Yeah. You know, there's, there's nothing more refreshing than being around someone that you know is going through something really hard, but their attitude they, is, is still upbeat. They still have the joy of the Lord. And you know that they're going through some tough stuff. Right. That's what I think is so amazing to be around people that are full of the Holy Spirit, right. that ha still have that peace, they have that calm, and are the same. And I think that's really, you said in a nutshell, what God wants us to show to the world. He, he wants us to show them that, yes, we have problems just like you do, yeah. but there is a different way to handle those problems. The Apostle Paul never one time told the believers that he would pray for their problems to go away. Hmm. Never. You can't find a place where he said he would pray for their problems to go away. He, he said he prayed for them that they would bear their trouble with good temper, mm -hmm. that they would maintain a good attitude. So we're not helping anybody, say, who doesn't know Jesus, who's already got an attitude that Christians are, you know, goody two-shoes and really fakes and phonies. We're, we're not helping them by acting like, oh, you know, if, if you serve God, then everything in life is going to come up roses and you're never, ever, ever going to have a problem. I tell people when I do altar calls that receiving Jesus doesn't mean you're never going to have another problem. Right. Matter of fact, for a while you could have more because the devil's <laughs> going to be yeah. going to be coming after you. But your your worst day with Jesus will still be better than your best day ever was without Him because when you have Him, you're never alone. Um, I'm I'm wanting to. Um, define our conversation a little bit um, from a male perspective. <laughs> if you are not being truly authentic, then you would, the, you'd fall into the ditch of being a phony on one side and fall into the ditch of being just a chronic complainer on the other side, right. mm -hmm. okay? So if those are the two ditches and we're down the road and we're trying to get to this authentic, unique me, um, we got to stay on the road. And so earlier, um, before we were actually uh, started this broadcast, we were kind of, you were kind of picking on me and then you thought <laughs> I was picking on you. And then, and then we got to the point of me saying something like, um, if, if, if somebody, uh, is dressed up for dinner you and said you me. okay I know so but I didn't I, want to so use you as the example I think but you're wanting permission you, to be because you have a paintbrush in your hand that you might stick me in the neck with so if she comes out and we're ready to go to dinner and I don't particularly like what she's wearing it's not appropriate to say 
hey, I don't like what you're wearing. That doesn't seem kind. It doesn't seem all sorts of stuff. Um, and then you started correcting me by saying, well, listen, if you're being truly authentic, it means what? There, there's, there's ways to be tempered and stay out of the two ditches of just complaining all the time. Yeah, well, about, hey, you look terrible in that. That's kind of brutal. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're not talking about brutality. You look fat right. But <laughs> there's a there's a way there's a way to say things in wisdom. Most, most of the time, and I don't know if you do this, Lori, but I'll ask Dave, do you like this? Yes. Does this look good on me? Yes. Well, if you're asking for an opinion, then you should be ready yes. to take the truth. Okay. And so I don't, I may really like something, but I don't really want to be wearing something around all evening if I'm going to be with Dave, if he doesn't like it. Right. I mean, I want to right. look good for him. And there are many times when I will go and change my clothes because he doesn't particularly like something that I have on, even though I love it and don't understand why he doesn't like it. That, I think that's just, that's just being honest. You know, I don't know if that's authentic so much as it is honest. Okay, even at your age, you care still? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, David, I've been married 54 years, but I still care. I want him to like the way I look and think I'm pretty. And As you get a little older, you get into the retirement phase-ish of your life, um, you start feeling like you've earned the right to be a little <laughs> more opinion. opinionated. Uh, talk about that for a minute inside the context of... Uh, authentically unique. Well, I heard this statement, and I really like it. You're never truly free until you no longer have a need to impress anyone. I say, I love that. I love that. And at my stage of life, 45 years in ministry, at this point, very successful ministry, I don't need to try to impress anybody. I am what I am, and you're either going to like me or you're not. Mm. And, you know... I believe that God gives me favor, but there's always going to be somebody that's not going to like you. Right. And so... Um, it's because they don't know you. Yeah, I, I just think there's so much problem with people comparing themselves with other people, trying to be something that they're not. And it makes them miserable. I mean, I tell all my stories about when God was trying to teach me how to be me and I had a lady that lived next door to me that was Miss Arts and Crafts, and she made her family's clothes and had a garden and all these things. And I mean, I, Dave had to sew his own buttons on his shirts. I just wasn't good at all that stuff. Oh, and did I, you think? I tried first. I tried to be like her. I got a sewing machine. I took lessons. And so here I'm sitting and doing something I hate. I hated every minute of it just to prove that I was a normal woman. Mm. And... I was normal. I was just my version of normal. Yeah. You know, we don't have to all be like somebody else to be okay. And I think that one of the biggest problems that people have is they just don't like who they are. Mm. Wow. They just do not like themselves. And you can't, you know, I was, when I first started really hearing the word, I kept hearing all these messages about loving people, loving people, loving people, loving people. And I really wanted to, but I just had a hard time doing it. And I couldn't figure out why, because if you really want to do the right thing and you can't do it, so God, what's the problem here? And he said, well, you don't love yourself. Mm. You can't give away what you don't have. Mm. So God loves us first. And then loving yourself in a balanced way really just means accepting God's love. You're just, you're, you're accepting what he's giving you as a gift. And there's so much that God tries to give us that we don't accept. Right standing with him through Christ is another one. How many people spend most of their life feeling guilty when guilt is really just our useless way of trying to pay for our sins when Jesus has already paid for them? Wow. And so whatever God gives us, it basically does us no good if we won't receive it. So when you receive it, that's when it starts to really work in your life and become real. And we should have the right to be real with each other. I don't have to feel bad because I can't do what you do, or I don't look what the way you look, or you know, whatever the case might be. If somebody's a little bit weighs a little more than this person, you know, I, we don't have to be jealous of each other. We don't have to 
dislike somebody because we think they've got something better than us. We don't have to try to be like them. And even in the church setting, you know, I mean, I know we had a woman come to our church and she was an intercessor and she got up every morning at hmm. four and prayed for five hours. And so I said, that's it, man. I'm, that's the key. I'm going to do that. I'm going to get up. And well, I got up and five minutes later, I was asleep on the floor. <laughs> but I'm not going to go tell anybody that. See, you just can't do what somebody else is doing. You can only do what God anoints you for. Right. And so I, I think the whole point of this book is for us to have better relationships, but also to be free from all this comparison and trying to be what you're not. And then it, then it gets into people pleasing. And how often do we do things that we absolutely do not want to do and don't even feel like we're supposed to do just to keep somebody else happy with us. I see uh, in your book, you write it this way, which is kind of what you've been talking about over the last few minutes. What others think of you isn't nearly as important as what you think of yourself. Right. Okay. And, um, and that's just knowing that you're loved by God and that he's well, created me this way. Well, okay, let me just ask you a question. Do you like yourself? Most times. <laughs> well, I mean, yes. But see, there's a difference. I'm not asking if you like everything you do. Right. Okay. I'm asking if you like yourself. Yeah. And see, I don't like everything I do, mm -hmm. but I do like myself. Mm -hmm. And that's, for some reason, that sounds funny to people when you say that. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's this old religious thinking. Well, I'm this terrible person and I'm a worm and I'm no good. And I don't know why people love that, but they don't like it. Mm -hmm. If you like yourself, I was in Pennsylvania one time and I was preaching along these lines and I said, I like myself. Mm -hmm. Well, I spent a lot of years hating myself mm -hmm. and I was miserable, but I like myself because God created me with his own hand in my mother's womb Yes. The Amplified Bible says carefully and intricately. So what an insult to our creator to not like ourselves. Yeah. If he took that kind of time in creating each one of us uniquely, then the least we can do is show him the respect of liking what he created. But in my sermon, I said, I like myself. The next day it came out in the paper. Meyer says she likes herself. Huh. Well, it was like, Jeez. obviously they didn't like it that I said that yeah. and made it sound like I was full of myself. And that's, that's not the case at all. I mean, God doesn't want us to hate ourselves. Right. He doesn't want us to be against ourselves. We cannot give away what we yeah. don't have. Yeah. And God expects everything that he gives us. I always say to you and through you. He gives me forgiveness, so I will give forgiveness to other people. Yeah. He gives me mercy so I can be merciful to others. Yeah. He loves me so I can give love to others, but I can't do that if I don't love myself. Yeah, so take that through the back door. If I hated myself, right. hate everything about me, I can't no. love everyone through that. No, and, and, and I yeah. did for years. I hated myself. I hated my voice. I hated this. I hated that. And the whole thing with my voice is funny because now God blasts it all over the the universe, and it is different, it is unique, but because of that, it kind of grabs people's attention. Yeah. I'll be out in the mall and somebody will say that voice. Mm -hmm. I, I, rec I know that. You're Joyce Meyer. Mm -hmm. you, I can't hide because of my voice. Once I open my mouth, <laughs> it's all done and over with. And so I hated my voice, and yet God, did, God knows exactly what he's doing, mm -hmm. and he does things on purpose but we can't make use of the uniqueness that God has given us if we keep trying to be like somebody else. And that goes for men as it much as it goes does. for women. Men just right? won't admit it. Talk about that. Yeah, well. Not you, <laughs> you don't have to say anything. And I'm not picking on you at all, because you're great. Male ego, I mean, we all know that it's there. And I think God puts that in men just mm -hmm. because of the position that they're supposed to have, they don't want to ever look weak or needy, but <laughs> men, you know, I mean, my husband is a golfer and he would never say this and I hope he doesn't watch this program, but, <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't tell me that if Dave is playing with a bunch of really good golfers 
and he plays really bad that day, that it doesn't bother him at all. Yeah. Because I know that it, it does. But he would not come home and say, it really embarrassed me. Or, you know, where, w as women, we might say that. But it would be hard for a man to say that. But I think men have a lot of the same problems that women do. It's just that they're less likely to ask for the help to fix it. Mm -hmm. So when I golf <laughs> and, and I completely miss the ball and throw the club in the lake, right. that's more typical for me in so regard to golf. golfing. <laughs> um, <laughs> the takeaway so far, Joyce, is Joyce Meyer likes herself. <laughs> okay? I like it. That's the takeaway so far. And we all know people, because it's a common joke, who we say amongst ourselves, maybe to our spouses, that person loves themselves. When do you step over and fall into the ditch from liking yourself and that being appropriate to falling into the ditch and you love yourself? What, Very what's that answer. like? I didn't say to be in love with yourself. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I said to love yourself as God's creation. I don't love what I do. I may not like everything about, you know, the way I look or, you know, yeah. I, my hair's real baby fine. I would love to have thicker hair so I could do little different things with my hair, but hey, this is what I got, so you gotta make yeah. the best out of it. Mm -hmm. But I'm not talking about being selfish and self-centered and being in love with yourself and expecting the whole world to revolve around you. I'm talking about a healthy, I'm really just talking about receiving the love of God. Right. And when I say I like myself, I hope and pray that there's a few million people mm. watching that decide, well, yeah, maybe I, can, maybe I could do that too. Mm. Beautiful. You know, it's not God's will for people to, God is for you. He doesn't want you to be against you. The devil's against you. Yeah. So when you're always just finding fault with yourself and feeling bad about yourself all the time, the devil loves that. He mm, yeah. makes him and hell, all of hell happy. Yeah. Break down the, in, a, a little deeper, the idea of liking yourself, even loving yourself in the appropriate way, and not liking or not loving what you do. How do you separate that in your mind? Well, a long time ago, God gave me this phrase, your who is different than your do. Okay, hang on. Let me <laughs> let me absorb that. Your who is different than you got it. Okay. okay. Take your own kids. I don't always like everything my kids do. <laughs> but I always love my kids. Yes. Well, God's the same way. He doesn't like everything we do, but we're no surprise to God. He knew everything that we were going to do before he ever invited us into relationship with him. Mm. So he, he kind of is just waiting for what he knows is already going to happen. And he's already decided he's going to forgive us if we're willing to repent. And so if you want to really want to use your faith for something, use it to be free from guilt and condemnation. Yeah. I suffered so unbearably with, with guilt because of the way I grew up. And I, even though my father was sexually abusing me, somehow the enemy made me think it was my fault. My goodness. And there was something wrong with me. So I had this little record playing in my head most of my life, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me, what's wrong with me. So for me to come to the point, hmm. I mean, for me to come to the point where I can say, I like myself and I know that I have faults and I, but I also know that I love God and that I want to change and that I'm not where I need to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. And you, you have to be able to see yourself in Christ. Right. You know, like right now I'm studying holiness. I've been on that kick for two or three weeks. And because we don't hear enough about that. Yeah. The Bible says pursue holiness without which no man will see the Lord. So, you know, we've got a lot of, excuse me, sloppy Christianity mm -hmm. today where people tend to think that, you know, because of the grace of God, they can get by with whatever and it's okay. I mean, like, talked to somebody recently in the middle of getting a divorce, living, living with his girlfriend. And he says to this other friend, 
why don't we fast one day a week for the fruit of the Spirit? I'm like, give me a break. <laughs> you know, you're living with your girlfriend. You're yeah. in the middle of getting a divorce, but, but you think fasting for the fruit of the Spirit is going to help you? Why don't you go back and get the living with the girlfriend thing straightened out? Mm. <laughs> before you try to do some spiritual exercise that you think is going to help you. So I've been studying holiness yeah. and looking at a book this morning. And see, the Bible says we are holy, that we are sanctified. That's positionally. That's the position that we have with God through Christ. We are the righteousness of God in Christ, but that's positionally. So we're working, it's like we're working out something that we already have. So God puts all these, it's kind of like when you're born again, he downloads a little bit of everything that he is into your spirit. And then the Bible says in Philippians 2, now work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, not in your own strength, but with God helping you. So the Holy Spirit comes into our life to help us then take these little seeds that's in our spirit, water them with the Word, and little by little begin to manifest what the Bible says you already have. So when I say I am the righteousness of God in Christ, I truly really am, but that doesn't mean I do everything right. Got it. So you, you got to know the difference in your who and your do.